Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, which is increasingly more people as I spend less and less time in, in the building over there in ICS, um, I'm Jillian Hayes. I'm a professor in informatics, and it is my distinct pleasure to be the host of this afternoon's speaker, Evening for Him, uh, because uh, we've got a little time zone differential here. Um, I am just so, so thrilled uh, that Dr. Juan Gilbert has given us some time this afternoon because his research could not be more timely. We were just discussing as people were filtering in just how timely it really is. Uh, so um, you can obviously read his bio online and I won't uh, dig into all the details, but he is the Banks Family Preeminence Endowed Professor, as well as the department chair uh, at the University of Florida Computer and Information Science and Engineering. Um, and I mostly have interacted with your work, I realized Dr. Gilbert, through much more of your disability related research and so on, but the work that he's going to talk about today, I just can't tell you all how um, thrilled I am to hear about it because much more about trustworthiness in voting systems and how we can do a better job. And if you've been paying attention to the news and the concerns and so on, this is um, a really, really good time. Um, so Dr. Bill Gilbert is one of these really unique, interesting folks who has a PhD in computer science and so has done a lot of very heavy, um, you know, traditional computer science kind of technical work, but also works in human computer interaction, learning technologies, assistive technology, and so on. So really bridges a lot of the interests that we have in the informatics uh, department, and then also has just been such a wonderful, strong voice about how we can use computing and telecommunication and information technologies and so on uh, to support all kinds of diverse and minoritized and underrepresented populations. Um, so I love Dr. Gilbert's work because it makes a strong, strong social impact. And, um, and many of you will also recognize his name from winning the Sig Chi Social Impact Award this year, um, as well as being an ACM fellow and a million other things. Uh, so won't, won't read off the, the whole bio, um, but just so thrilled to have you here today, Dr. Gilbert, and for sharing your expertise with us. Um, and I always feel better when you talk. I always feel hopeful and optimistic about the future. So I am looking forward to feeling that same way on this fine, cloudy Friday afternoon. Um, as a reminder to folks both online and in person, we do have the transcription on. So for accessibility reasons, if you need the closed captioning, please go ahead and pop that up. Um, I will be monitoring the chat and can certainly uh, interrupt and interject if there's any questions along the way that that um, are urgent and so on. Um, but also, um, of course, Daniel is in person in uh, DBH and can help moderate questions there. Uh, and uh, with that, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Juan Gilbert. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Let me share my screen. We're good, everybody can see it? Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk to you about a new project out of my lab. And the title of this is Detecting Ballot Manipulations with a Transparent Voting Machine. So let's just dive right in. So let me begin with some definitions. Ballot marking device. It's a computing device that has a touch screen, it usually has accessibility features and it allows a voter to mark their ballot. And in general terms, the ballot marking device uh, allows the voter to use their headset and a switch and or the touch screen and then to mark your ballot, then it prints a ballot, a paper ballot. And that voter can verify their selections on that paper ballot, either by uh, visually looking at it or scanning it by another machine and having it read back to them, things like that. So that's a ballot marking device. And these are being used uh, widely throughout the United States as accessible voting machines. And some places use them as the voting machine, like Georgia, the entire state, everybody votes on ballot marking devices for in-person voting. So there have been studies on ballot marking devices. And these studies were looking at what would happen if you flip votes? Uh, in other words, creating anomalies on the paper, would people notice? 
That's the question. We'll talk about that. The first study to examine this was done by my lab, and we didn't realize it, but it was interesting. Uh, we created a voting system called Prime 3. It's an open source voting system, and I'll talk more about that later. But Prime 3 was created back in 2003. Uh, and at the time we created it, uh, we didn't realize it, but we had created the world's most accessible voting technology. Uh, in other words, it allowed people to vote by touch and or voice. Uh, you could speak to it. And this technology was open, again, open source. And it's the first open source voting technology to be used in state, federal, and local elections in the United States. So we did a study on on-screen anomalies and we would, in other words, a voter would select someone, let's say they selected Donald Trump and it would switch their vote uh, on the review screen to Joe Biden and then it would print on the paper, Joe Biden. And as you can see here, the overall detection rates. So on screen, we, on the review screen, 73.6% of the participants noticed, but 16.4 noticed on the paper and only 10% did not detect. So that was a study we did, uh, as you can see there, back in 2013. More recently, University of Michigan researchers did a study similar flipping votes where they wanted to see if people would detect. And in their study, they only had 40% of their participants even reviewed the ballot with only 6.6% noticing or telling the poll worker something was wrong. Well, this study created a lot, got a lot of attention and alarmed a lot of people. Uh, the issue here was that, wait a minute, if only 6.6% .6 of the people would notice I flipped their vote on the paper, well, then we could do this and change the outcome of an election clearly and no one would notice. So that was the, the, the fear factor there. Rice University did a similar study. And what they found is that their study showed that if voters they can detect changes if they only attempt to do so. And in their particular study, 76% detected anomalies, but you know, they were prompting them to do so, to check. Overall detection though was only at 17.6%. That's a, a, a major jump from the 6.6, .6, but still very small. And so people were very alarmed about the ballot marking device and flipping votes and could you change the outcome of the election undetected? So with these things in mind and other things we've done in the past with voting, we wanted to make improvements. So we created this transparent voting machine. Uh, it's a prototype and it's powered by Prime 3. So let me show you what it looks like. Oh, before I show the demo, let me tell you about Prime 3. Again, Prime 3 is open source. It was universally designed. The idea was that everyone would vote on the same machine, independent of their ability or disability. People that can't see, they can't hear, people that can't read, people without arms could all vote on the same machine as anyone else. It had a touch screen. We allowed people to vote with a headset and switches. Uh, and here's the video of the transparent voting machine. Now notice I'm um, touching the screen, I make a selection and I had to print my selection. And it printed my selection right in front of me. Now, before I can continue, I actually have to touch that selection to go to the next contest or I can't do anything. So each time I have to touch the printed selection. Otherwise, the voting process is halted and, and you, you're not doing anything. You're not making any progress. If I don't touch my selection, I cannot continue. And this is just an example of a write-in.
And again, you see no selection. You, here's a case where I can select multiple candidates. There's a, prop, uh, a, mem a proposition style thing where I can select yes, no. I review it, I like it, and my ballot is done. Okay, so that gives you an idea of the transparent voting machine. Again, that's running a version of Prime 3. So it has all the accessibility features of Prime 3. That is the first version of the prototype that was created that you saw, made a few tweaks to it, but you get the general idea. So let's talk about the research findings. So what you saw there was what we call TIPI or Transparent Interactive Printing Interface. That's what that interface is, okay? The idea was to make the paper part of the interface. So it prints something and you have to touch that something. It becomes part of the interface. So we did a study where one contest is flipped or changed on the printout. Participants were told the experiment was investigating post-election sentiment using this particular voting machine. I had 151 participants in this study. Here's a picture of me with a participant. I ran this study in February and uh, March of, uh, of, of this year. So right after the presidential election, uh, the idea was that we needed to run it and it happened to be in the, the peak of the pandemic. But uh, you can see here, I'm in the, our science library. There's a participant seated there in front of the machine. And then you can see her voting and you can see me sitting there with the laptop taking notes. And there's a laptop that is connected to the uh, transparent, the TIPI interface or the transparent voting machine that is controlling the interface so I can see what's going on. I'm taking notes, et cetera. So that's the study setup. It was the Florida 2018 and 2020 ballot combination. I had 12 contests. Obviously the president was at the top of the ballot and you can see the other contests there, the Senator, congressional representative, governor, and so on. So 12 contests. These are the candidates for each contest. Again, it was the president that contest that just occurred. And I was using the data from the 2018 or the 2020 ballot. And here's the last half of it. So notice that also I added none of the above is an option. Uh, that they could select. I wanted that as an option. So they didn't, if they didn't want to vote for someone, they still would have to make some sort of selection. So I had 81 women, 70 men in the study. Here's their race, ethnic uh, backgrounds. So I got a pretty diverse group of people to participate. With respect to age, again, we tried to get a good diverse group. Um, the largest group there was 18 to 23 year olds because I've spent, and you'll see this a little later, I did uh, most of the study was on campus, but I went off campus and collected data as well to get some of those older participants. So this is an important point. When I do this study, what are the potential outcomes? The first one is they notice when the flip or change occur on the ballot at the, the exact time. So I touch uh, Donald Trump, I say print it, and it print Joe Biden, and they notice and they say something. Okay, that's outcome number one. Another possible outcome is they notice, but they didn't say anything. So some of you are studying HCI, and, and you have heard about the Hawthorne effect, which means when people are subjects in a study and they know they're being studied, it changes their behavior. 
Well, this actually was true here. In other words, I would flip a vote, but they wouldn't say anything and they noticed. And so what I started having to do was say, did you notice I changed one of your votes? And they would speak up and say, yeah, but you know, it's a study. I didn't think anything of it. So the Hawthorne effect was in play in this study. And in order to tease that out, I had to ask them, did you notice I changed one of your votes? So here, the second outcome is they noticed, but they didn't speak up. Number three, they identified the change on paper after the prompt. So if I asked them, did you notice? And they say, yes. And then I say, okay, well, can you tell me which one? They say, yeah, you flipped the governor. Fourth condition, they did not notice or identify the change. So I asked them, they say, no. I show them their ballot and they could not identify. It. The fifth is if they said they noticed the change but couldn't identify the change on paper. So there are five possible outcomes. Notice when it occurs. I noticed, but I didn't say anything, yet I could correctly identify it. Or I just identified it on the paper. Or I did not notice, and I could not identify. And then last, I said I noticed, but I didn't correctly identify. And this is just a graph of those possible outcomes uh, that we uh, charted out as well. OK. So 54 people or 36% noticed the flip or change and spoke up immediately. OK, so 36%. Then there was 41% that noticed but didn't say anything, but they correctly identified the change. This is a huge finding here. Uh, none of the other studies had this, but we found this, meaning the Hawthorne effect was real, and 41% said they noticed and correctly identified the change. Now you combine those two, that's a 77% detection rate, okay? So we'll talk about that a little later, but this is important. I'm at 77% already. Those who could cor correctly identify the change on paper, meaning they voted, and then at the end, they looked at the ballot and said, wait a minute, this is wrong. That was 15.9%. Those who did not notice and did not identify the flip is only at 6.6%. .6%. Only 10 people could not identify. One person said, I noticed it changed, but I didn't say anything, and they couldn't identify the flip. And I noticed that this individual, she's 67-year-old white female who was randomly selecting things and I think she just confused herself. She wasn't, she was just participating in study uh, to kill time, I guess, but she wasn't sincere in her action in voting. Here's a pie chart that shows uh, what we found. And again, 6.6% .6 did not notice and could not identify, which is a tremendous finding here. Overall, 93% either noticed or noticed and didn't say anything and found it on paper or identified it on paper. So we had 93% uh, at the, the top of our identifications or being able to identify. And again, this is the ballot, okay? So notice that at the top of the ballot is president and senator, congressional representative, governor. And if I look at this, here are the flips or changes per contest. So I weighted the number of flips to the top of the ballot because that's where the high value is. And so president had 50, but only one participant did not notice and could not identify. So if you look here, going down this distribution, if I was trying to be strategic to hack this and say, well, I could do the lower part of the ballot, that doesn't give you any confidence because the recognitions are high throughout the ballot. That's the point of me showing you this. Okay. And again, the top of the ballot is the high value, which we had tremendous recognition at the top of the ballot. And this is just a, a, a graph that shows the distribution of how many uh, additional votes that notice uh, so you can see, again, there were 50 flips, 
and did not notice was one for contest one. And you can see the distribution there. So we had just great recognition overall up and down the ballot. And if we were to, we did analysis on the top half of contest one to six, 84% recognition. If you do the bottom half, 55%. If I divide it in thirds, you could see there 88%, 52%, and 64% on the bottom third. So with these recognition accuracies, uh, this is just a tremendous finding that hadn't been noticed before. So if we look at uh, contest one to four, there were 97 flips, 88% notice rate. And if I look at the correlation there, a negative correlation that would suggest going down the ballot, you're less likely to notice. And that's just contest one to four, many, those four contests, people notice more in one, more in two, more in three. I mean, more in one, less in two, less in three, less in four, it was still high but it was a slight decrease and you see the same thing in five to eight, but then nine to 12, it was the opposite. Meaning they had a higher accuracy in 12, then higher in 11, higher in 10 and higher in nine. Uh, so the correlations here don't give you any confidence either if I'm an attacker. And other, so essentially it makes it difficult to identify where to flip to cheat. There's, there's no, for a certain weak point. And this is just the notices per contest, uh, just raw data showing that we had high accuracy throughout. Um, it, you couldn't determine where to flip votes if you were trying to change the outcome of an election undetected. The study happened across five different locations. I did a barbershop. We had eight participants there. Uh, the computer science and engineering building, three participants. Uh, I did a local health and fitness center where I got 48 participants. And this was important because I was able to get that older demographic at the Gainesville Health and Fitness Center. So that was very valuable. Uh, the Marston Science Library on campus was where you saw the pictures of myself and the participant. And then our student union, uh, I went there and got 15 participants. So again, five locations, and I'm able to get uh, a large distribution of participants, and that worked out very well. Let me show you what it looked like. So this is the first screen that was available and I would enter an access code, uh, the participant would get this screen and they would have to touch start voting. And as you can see here, they would get candidates like this. And then the candidate would, I mean, the, uh, the participant would select someone like Biden Harris. Then they select print selection and it would print their selection as you see here right in front of them. And it would say, confirm your selection is correct, touch your selection to continue. And what was interesting, they read this and they would touch it. And at the end, they go through that process and they get a ballot that looks like this. This is called a ballot summary, which shows the contest and who you selected. So this approach eliminates any ambiguity about whom you voted for. It's clearly the selection that you made. So this is just an example, a sample ballot, so you can get an idea of what it looked like when it printed for them. Now, let me talk about a few takeaways. When I ran this study, it was interesting. This transparent interactive printing interface, Tippy, was is the first of its kind. No one in this study has ever interacted with a device like this. I had less than five participants ask how to use this. Everyone knew how to use it. They just sat down and naturally could use this. And that's across all age demographics. It didn't matter. I was amazed by that. They, in, they intuitively could use this. Now, one of the things that I think can improve this is changing the text that appears with the printed selection. 
So if I go back, see, so notice that confirm your selection is correct, touch your selection to continue. I'm going to modify that text. And we think we can make it such that uh, we would get even more recognition because people did read that text. I do know that they were reading it. And so here's a, a major takeaway in that we were able to create a new technology never used by anyone and run this study and they naturally could just use it. So that was a major takeaway for me. Another one, more than 40% of participants noticed the flip, but didn't say anything. And I mentioned this earlier, the Hawthorne effect is real. So if you're gonna do any voting studies like this, you have to account for this. And that's where I would say directly, did you notice I changed one of your votes? So again, the protocol was, uh, I would approach the participants and say, hello, I'm doing a uh, study on uh, post-election sentiment. Uh, post -election sentiment you'll get a $20 uh, Visa card to do the study. it will take uh, probably five to 10 minutes. Uh, would you be interested in participating? And once they agree, I give them the cons informed consent and those for those of you doing H HCI and doing uh, IRB, they get the informed consent and all of that. And they say, yes, I agree. And I would sit them down and I said, we're gonna use this technology for you to fill out your ballot. Yeah, I'll be sitting right here. If you have any questions or anything, just let me know. And I say, are you good? They say, yeah, okay, I'll start it for you. And then I entered in the access code and then they would begin to vote. If they went through the whole process and didn't say anything, I would take their ballot and hand it to them and say, is this your ballot? And then if they said yes, and they didn't say anything, then I would say, well, let me ask you a question. Did you notice I changed one of your votes? And that's when they would usually respond, yes, it was whatever. Or they would say, no, I didn't. And so that was the protocol used for all 151 participants. Now, recall that in the Michigan study, they had a 6.6% uh, detection rate and at best 40% reviewed their ballot. Rice only had a 17.6% overall detection rate. And they said that people can detect these things at a 76% detection of anomalies if they do it. Our minimum detection rate is 77%. And remember, if, if people check the ballot, it could go up to 93%. And in my study, only 6.6% did not notice and could not identify the flip. This is a tremendous finding. And of those that did not notice, 71% correctly identified the change. So overall, again, 93% is, is where we were uh, as far as correctly identifying changes on these anomalies on the ballot. So with that, given the overall minimum notice rate of 77%, and that's excluding on paper notices, it is unlikely an election could be hacked such that the hack would go unnoticed. Now, even in the scenario with the ballot marking device with the 6.6% detection rate, my colleagues alarm people by saying, if it's 6.6% will notice, I could flip, uh, change the outcome of an election. What they don't, understand and what they underestimate is what I call the human condition. And in my study, I noticed this. So I'll give you an example. There were cases where the presidential contest where we would flip Trump to Biden. And when that flip occurred, some of the participants would speak out and say, not only they noticed, but they would speak out in, in a sense of anger almost. And so what I'm saying here is that the fact that one person notices, you can't underestimate their voice. The human condition takes over, meaning a person could notice and say, this machine changed my votes and be very vocal about it in such a way that it can out if the machine was tampered with. So just looking at the statistical analysis of 6.6% in the Michigan study, 
were the numbers that noticed that 6.6% could be way more than enough to detect that something went wrong because they could be, are likely to be a vocal speaking up if their votes can properly switch. So with that, uh, good news is this uh, work is going to appear soon in ACM Interactions, uh, the November, December issue. We've um, actually had that accepted and I think it will appear online towards the second week of November. Uh, so you can go read about everything that I just uh, showed you. And uh, this work is moving forward. We have a patent that has been given. I should have put the patent in here uh, for this particular technology. And we're talking to voting machine manufacturers about licensing this technology and getting it out there in the real world. If you ask me what's next, I think um, the licensing process will keep going. And I think this is the future of voting. You will see transparent voting machines in the future. So with that, let me get into discussion. I like to leave a lot of time for discussion because this is a hot topic that people usually have a lot of questions about. So I try to make sure I have plenty of time to talk about these things and answer all your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have like a million questions, but I'm going to try to not do the moderator thing and steal all the question time. Um, it looks like we do have a question for one of our virtual attendees, Anne-Marie Piper. Um, Daniel, I don't know if she can unmute or not. I, I'm i lost when it comes to Zoom. It looks like she can. Hooray. I think I can. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilbert, for that fascinating talk and your work on this topic. I mean, it's it's very important. And I thought this, the overlay element was super clever. Um, and I think as you were talking, I was really excited about the potential for this to be an accessible device to serve many different people. And so I was wondering if you could tell us, since we have a lot of accessibility researchers here, tell us a little bit more about your process for both understanding and designing when you think about sort of a really broad set of needs. So we have students here who are working with people who are blind screen reader users. So I'm sure they're curious about that. Um, people with motor impairments. I work a lot with people with dementia. So just, can you tell us a little bit more about your process and, and what you did related to accessibility? Yes. So uh, as I mentioned, this is powered by Prime 3 with the software that's open source that we created years ago. And the idea, uh, and I could have talked more about that, but Prime 3 actually is being used. Uh, it was used in New Hampshire uh, as their accessible voting technology. And the ballot marking devices you see on the market, many, some of them were modeled after our technology. So how do we go about that? So we embedded ourselves with that community to understand the needs. And we were trying to design to target, again, if you can't see, if you can't hear, if you can't read, and if you didn't have arms, how would we do that? So we understood from research and other things we have done, how to accommodate those people. And so with that in mind, we came up with designs and we validated those designs through lots of tests, through lots of uh, experiments and elections and, and things with that population. And I'll show you, uh, we got a little time. Let me show you a quick demo of Prime 3. So I could, does the voter want to respond with a microphone? I'll just leave this on and you'll see how it works real quick. To start voting, say vote. Vote. Selected, start voting. There are seven contests for voting. Selected president and vice president. You are voting for president and vice president. This is to vote for Adam Kramer and Greg Vicolo. Selected Adam Kramer and Greg Vicolo. Selected U.S. Senate. You selected Victor Martinez. To go to the next contest, say vote. Vote. To vote for U.S. representative, say vote. Vote. Selected U.S. representative. Selected review my ballot. This is your ballot. Thank you. Your ballot is being printed. So I submit it, it would print this thing here, uh, as you can see. And 
So that gives you, oops, that gives you a little flavor of how it works. So it's, it can continually speak. So it doesn't use a screen reader. And I didn't show the settings where they can set the speed of the voice and things like that. But that you, I was hitting the tab key, which would be like a switch to go next, 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 and then hit enter or select to something. So you can use a switch. You can use uh, these kind of features. And you heard me responding with my voice. So notice I was saying vote, or I could blow into the microphone instead of saying vote in such a way that if someone was eavesdropping on me, they wouldn't know who I, where I was and what I was saying. So it did, I didn't say like uh, Joseph Varkey, it said to vote for Joseph Varkey, say vote, and I could have just blew into the microphone. And so the, all these elements were deliberate in the design and it happened over a time of years. It just so happened one of my students in the, in the, in the team was colorblind and I didn't know. And so it, it just worked out that over time we were able to do this and we did studies with people that we knew could not read. We did studies with kids and they were able to use the technology and we had pictures on the ballot. So we have information about that. So that's a, a long answer, but it just kind of gives you the flavor of how we came to be to design all the accessible features in a single unit that everyone can use. Thank you so much. And what a wonderful example of the importance of diversity within our own design teams that you just slipped in there for us. So uh, well done there. Um, we've got Stacy uh, with her hand up and then I've got also got a question for you in the chat that I'll read out after Stacy's. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, I, I'm gonna, I hope you'll indulge me for just a second. I wanted to share a little story about the first time I saw you speak, Dr. Gilbert. I was, I believe a junior in college a computer science major and I went to the Tapia conference and I'll never forget uh, I believe an example you gave about the this is what a scientist looks like drawing test um anyway ever since I've been committed to diversity equity inclusion and computing and um now I'm an assistant professor here doing that work so <laughs> anyway it's really great to see you again um but my question is I've been serving on the local voters accessibility committee and um, one of the really exciting things they do here in California, and I'm ignorant to what we do in other states, um, is enable people who use assistive technologies to use their own assistive technologies in the comfort of their own home with their own setup. So say so you have JAWS and you're blind in order to vote. And I was wondering if you could reflect a little bit on um, whether you think that's the right direction to go or whether having the kind of like one centralized system where you're voting on the same machine as everyone else um, is, uh, is more appropriate for kind of universal accessibility. So uh, thank you, Stacy, for that. And uh, Stacy, just to be honest with everyone, you and I didn't talk before this, did we? So I did not ask her to ask that question. So that was not a question I planted. So Stacy brought that up. Thank you, Stacy. What you're looking at is Prime 3, the remote accessible version where uh, people can vote at home making their selections. And as you can see here, it would be using their own device where the screen reader, I could turn on my screen reader, but I, I, I wanna get to more questions. And they can mark their ballot, print it and mail it in. So to answer your question, I think we need all options. For in-person voting, you need a universally designed machine. For people who are voting remotely, you need them to use their technology. And so what I just showed you is the remote accessible version of Prime 3, and it's being used in Butler County, Ohio since 2018. So blind voters in particular, they uh, say they want to re vote remotely and use this technology. They get an email with a link to their ballot and then they can mark it and they, they proceed as follows. So I, I think you need both to answer your question directly. Thank you so much, that was perfect. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I love that every time anyone asks you a question, we get like a fresh demo. So this is like a new challenge for the audience to come up with something uh, to get a new demo from you. 
Um, so I want to just uh, highlight a comment in the chat from Jihan Johnston noting the importance of this session as um, she is a Georgia voter. So uh, thank you for the impact there. Uh, and then Vicki Jackson has a question um, about the open sourcing of the code and, you know, how can that potentially be used to maybe um, bring more confidence to uh, technologies for voting? How has that been embraced by the developer community or and or people interested in government transparency? So that's an interesting dynamic. I'm glad you asked that question. This is one of those areas that's counterintuitive. So that question that was asked that Dr. Hayes read, Yes, that's the intuitive part of it. Let, let me tell you where it's not intuitive. You think it's open source, that's a good thing in elections. People want to be able to see the code and you, you'd want that. But here's the problem. Election administrators are not IT people. So if you deploy open source, that means it's a more, creates more of a technical responsibility on them for deployment. So when New Hampshire adopted Prime 3, they saved hundreds of thousands of dollars. They use it for three years, but then they went back to a vendor. The reason they did that was because the technology management piece. So the vendors deploy these systems and technologies and stuff that are proprietary, but they give services with them. So they don't have to, to have the technical expertise to deploy them. So there's a interesting dynamic at play here, meaning the open source has the transparency aspect, but it creates a somewhat of a burden on support and management, which that particular election administration does not have. So we're trying to figure out how to get through that and, and that just hasn't been solved as of yet. So while, we, while we're figuring out the, the sort of hybrid environment, I wanted to make sure to pause and, and see if there are questions in the room. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I had a question around, like you spoke about the hospital, that's like how you like ask that question, because uh, we knew that like participants were not speaking up. Did you notice that like after a few like rounds that like people weren't speaking up, or how did you know that the hospital effect was like happening? If you and then, uh, and then I had uh, another question around like, what was like the inspiration for this project? Like, is there, like, I know like there's a lot of different things that could potentially go wrong around voting. Um, and what was the process for you to in identifying like, oh, like this, the, on the user end, that's where the sort of process uh, happened in terms of like the discrepancy of the vote? All right, so the, the, that's a good question. Let me, I should have mentioned that early. So uh, as a common practice, since there's so many students here, when you get ready to run a study, before you do the study, you do what? You do a pilot. You experiment with your lab mates and others. I did a pilot study, and that's where I started to notice things like this. So everybody can see my face, right? Jillian, Jillian you can see my face, right? So this is what would happen they would be touching the screen and it would flip their vote and they would do this. <laughs> and then they would continue. So I noticed a physical change in their behavior, but they wouldn't speak up. But that was in the pilot. So that's when I identified it and that's when I knew I needed to start asking that question. So just, this is the professor and me, before you run your studies, you always do the pilot to understand that the protocol and everything flows and works the way it's supposed to because you will identify things like this and now you can adapt the protocol as needed to get there. So that's what that's what, when I noticed and that's how I adapted it. But it was literally, people would look and look around and, and do all these, uh, you see a physical change and they would not speak up. That's when I, I noticed, okay, something's going on. All right, was there another question in there? What was the second question? The 
second question was around like, you know, the in the process of counting votes, voting, counting votes, right? The whole process, right, around how uh, votes get counted, right? And like there could be a number of things that could go wrong. I'm curious as to like why why you decided to investigate the first aspect of it, which is like, you know, the, the thing that could go wrong in the voting process is when uh, someone turns in the vote, right? Because like there could be a number of other problems that have been way down the line. So what was the inspiration around that first part of it? Uh, primarily because uh, my colleagues were making all this noise about uh, the 6.6 percent. We could hack a con uh, election and no one would notice. And so I got honestly just got tired of hearing it and wanted to solve that problem first. We do have work on the other end. There's work on what we call risk limiting audits to verify outcomes of election and things like that. We, we have some work that uh, a paper that uh, we submitted where we looked at optical character recognition to automatically recognize the text on the ballot instead of using QR codes and barcodes. And we have a method that turned up uh, nearly 100% accuracy and things like so we are working on all ends of it. I just didn't talk about that. As, as, I mean, that's a whole nother talk in itself. I can't tell if there's other questions in the room, but I can see that Aaron Trammell has a question on the Zoom. So Daniel, if you're okay, we can go to him. Yep. Um, hi, thank you for the uh, a really amazing uh, presentation and really important work. I'm so happy you're doing this. Um, my question is about whether um, you've uh, spoken, and you may not have, but I'm curious about it, have you spoken to any people who are skeptical about um, uh, voting integrity, about whether or not this um, would raise their confidence? I guess I'm a little concerned that there's been so much misinformation this past year that I wonder about certain populations, um, if there's anything that would make them believe that an election was fair. Uh, so, yeah, I, I can answer that. The the <laughs> interesting answer is that you 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 had part of the answer in your question, which is there are certain segments. It doesn't matter how they vote; they will if their person doesn't win. It was hacked. Whether they're voting with hand marked paper ballots, whether they're voting on a, a election technology, it doesn't matter. And we've seen this in the last election, so it it doesn't matter how they vote; they would claim that. Now, for those in the middle. Uh, I can say that my colleagues in security are, are compelled by what I've done. Uh, they have conceded that, dang, he solved that part. Now, the next thing that they wanted to say was, well, you know, if I was going to hack this one, I'd probably just they'd come up with some other scenario. So we have another uh, innovation we're working on. So this is October 2021. Check with me in May of 22. We should have an announcement then of another technology that we're putting out that we're going to uh, even further secure elections and, and using the transparent voting machine. So to answer your question, uh, for those who had concerns about ballot marking devices, yes, this does address vote flipping. Uh, there's it's unquestionable that we got extremely high recognition, and I even could get go even better. I didn't even mention this part, but if I wanted to, we actually have in the software design, I can use eye tracking to ensure that you looked at what was printed. In other words, you can't go forward until you look at it. That's built into the software already. So, and that's an easy implementation, uh, everybody. But th these are things that we've done to, to increase confidence. Hopefully that'll work, but there's a segment of the population, no matter what happens, if their person doesn't win, that means it was, you know, hacked. Thank you. Other questions in the room? Uh, I'll, I'll take the opportunity, since you mentioned eye tracking, one of the questions that, that I had um, was whether you, you thought about that as part of your study design, especially if you're thinking about these potentially nonverbal responses that a participant might have. Was that something that, that you thought about 
uh, incorporating or were there your limitations or other reasons why you thought that that might not uh, be a, a good uh, example or, or a good source of data that you would think? Yeah, I was going to implement the eye tracking in the study, but uh, we had some difficulties integrating with that box that we have, the transparent box. And timeliness was important. I needed to get the studies going in February because I wanted it to be, you know, hot after the election. And everybody's talking about the election, so I needed that. So we didn't do that, but it's it's there. Uh, as far as data gathering, um, that that would have been an extra data point, but the results turned out to be so powerful. I don't know how much more I would have gotten out of it other than be the sack and guarantee that they looked at it uh, because so many of them were able to identify the actual change. So that gave me confidence that they they looked at it. Um, and they couldn't just, you know, people, some people ask me, could I just click through and go quickly? No, it, it wouldn't allow that. In other words, when it printed, it, it had like a delay in there where you couldn't just click the, where it was printing and just keep going, you had the, it would pause for a second. So it, it was things like that. We were very strategic in the design of this to have security, usability, and access, accessibility. Got it, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And, and this is bringing to mind for me this perpetual tension we have between, you know, making things really secure making them accessible and the speed with which you can complete all of your work. And I just am imagining all those long voting lines and so on and wonder what you think, how, how's the dynamics of this fit into our existing sort of broken ecosystem? Yep, and uh, you, you, you know, you and I did not talk about this uh, <laughs> prior, to, <laughs> prior to this presentation, but there again, you, you, Ask the question. There's inline, a demo. Yes. <laughs> InlineTicketing.org. We created an inline ticketing system. So for loan lines, uh, and I did this in response to the pandemic, and this is free and available. Anybody can download it. Uh, I did it in uh, Windows and in uh, um, iOS. It's an app that you can put on a computer. So the way it works, you have a computer. And you have a printer and you have a QR code scanner connected to the computer. And if a line forms, what you can do is, let me show this. I'll show you the actual application. Can you guys see it? Yep. All right, so a line is formed and the way it works is you have a line you have the voter verification area, and then you have what I call the black box where people go in and vote. And what you do is you look at how many people come out on the back end. So if people are coming out at a rate of two minutes, every two minutes a person comes out, that's my waiting time. And I can say uh, a ticket will expire in 10 minutes, or five, I'm gonna say 10 minutes. And then what I would do is say, okay, a line is formed and I have five people in the line. So I print five tickets and I was just, so you can see what a ticket looks like. It has a QR code. It tells you when to come back. It's in Spanish as well as English. And there will be five of these and you go down the line and you hand them out and they come back and then you would scan the ticket and it would give a thumbs up to vote or a thumbs down, you can't vote or come back and it tell you information about the ticket. So we addressed lines in, in that respect of uh, being able to allow people to not, to have a virtual line. In other words, you can go anywhere you want and have a virtual line and come back with the ticket. And so we've addressed that. So we, we've been looking at the whole process. We have a project on voter verification, voter ID. Uh, we're working on every aspect of this. And here's the cool thing about all this. The code and things that you've seen, I've had undergraduates over since 2003 working on this. How cool is it to be an undergrad who did an REU research experience in the summer and then go vote somewhere and, and look at the machine and be able to say, wait a minute, that looks just like what I did that summer. So think about it. We've changed voting in the United States of America. And over 50 undergrads participated in this. 
So it, it's real work and it is going to change voting even more. Thank you so much. I said before, I always feel hopeful every time you talk and I'm so grateful for, for the way in which you, you just framed that. Um, we are getting close to the end of our time, but we do have one more question in the chat, if you don't mind humoring us with one more. Uh, Novia Wong has asked um, about any of the trade-offs that you might've had to make when you're designing various prototypes that you've shown us today and how you go through that process of deciding what you're gonna include and exclude. Um, that's hard for me to answer. And uh, for those of you who know me, you know, you'll understand why I say this. We don't trade off, to be honest, to, to allow people who are blind to vote. That's not some, that's not a compromise. We, we will make it work. We, we try not to have these trade offs and, and balancing things. We were adamant. Blind people will be able to vote. People without arms will be able to vote. We will make this work. And so we, we were adamant about that. So it's hard for me to think about things that were trade-offs because from a design perspective, we use best practices and things we knew would work and we incorporated them in a way that could work to accommodate the largest group of people. And we tested these. Again, we validated these. We went we had people that, again, that can't see, can't hear, can't read. We had people in, in wheelchairs. We, we, we tested with all these different demographics to validate these designs. So to me, the most important thing is you validate your designs. Now, we didn't get it right on the first try every time. Like the prompts, that stuff was, it was interesting. It was interesting to see the first time when we first designed it, we had a blind uh, student using it and it was a struggle for her, but she kept coming back and testing it. And we said, well, why do you keep trying? I mean, we know we've made some errors in the design. She said, because this is the first time I ever been able to do this by myself. And that changed our whole perspective. Thank you so much. And, uh... I love that notion of just setting your values and deciding you're not gonna compromise on the things that really matter. So um, with that inspirational message, I think for a Friday afternoon slash evening, uh, let's thank Dr. Gilbert again for giving up his very, very valuable time to come and share with us today. Um, we've got some chats uh, thanking you for your talk uh, in both depth and breadth. Um, and uh, please, you know, uh, I can tell you for sure, if you email this man, he will write you back. You can tweet at him. You can do all kinds of things. Um, I encourage people to, to reach out and keep the conversation going. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. <laughs>